Welcome to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast for fans who aren't ready to let go, and newcomers to the series who are ready to jump in. I'm Drew Shulman. And I'm Marie Vigourou. In this episode, we're diving into Supernatural Season 8, Episode 14, Trial and Error. Let's get this show on the road. I'm glad we got Kevin back. Like, poor little Bean. I'm happy to see him, but like, ugh. I was gonna say, he's doing well. He's on the houseboat, but he's really not doing all that well. Poor babes. <laughs> if he was doing that exact same thing, but on like a land house, we'd be like, ooh, poor Kevin. But it's like, it's on a boat, it's a little more fun at least. Like, he's on a boat. You, It's not to like. He's on a boat. <laughs> Everything's slightly more enjoyable on a boat. It's a safe houseboat, actually. Yeah, safe houseboat. It really reminds me of like the safe spaceship from... <laughs> <laughs> From our flag means Jeff. This is a safe space ship. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that. This week, patron and coffee supporters got to hear us answer the question, how would you decorate your dream bedroom or nest on the supporter exclusive Impala Talk feed? You can go to carryingwayward.com to support us and claim your perks. Are we ready for today's recap? Oh, I am very ready. Fantastic. I hope you are. (laughs) Count me down. Three, two, one. I like a man who knows how to handle his meat. Oh, God. (laughs) You're getting way too good at these. We find out that Kevin has been living a pretty less than healthy lifestyle while trying to decipher these last little bits of the tablet that he could, figuring out there's these trials. And finally, he does call Sam and Dean to come see him because he thinks he's figured it out. And there's these trials, but he only knows the first one, which is to go kill a hellhound, bathe in its blood, and say a thing. So they decide, of course, the only way to go... First of all, poor Kevin. They, like, half are like, let's make sure you're okay, but also here's some uppers so you can keep going. We'll talk. They find a family who, like, struck it rich in the middle of bumfuck nowhere and are suddenly doing super well, but we can't figure out which one of them actually made the deal, but we do have a hellhound there killing people, and we find out that it's the really nice, attractive... um, a barn hand who has a thing for Dean and she has figured it out and it's not the actual family and the hellhound does show up and Dean does fight it but ultimately Sam's the one who kills it and bathes in its blood and has to start the ritual and Dean's not very happy about it but Sam's all like I'm gonna stand my ground and be good about it time this episode was written by Andrew Dabb directed by Kevin Parks this is actually his first of two episodes for Supernatural the other one is Bad Boys for those who know which one that is And this episode originally aired on February 13, 2013. Is Bad Boy a episode coming up relatively soon, or...? Not this season. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay. But another solo dab episode. Interesting. Yeah, now he writes by himself. And I have a lot of things to say about this episode, particularly. I look forward to it. So this episode, to me, kind of feels like the characterization is pretty uneven. Or like maybe there are just too many threads of things happening. Like, I'm just not sure what's going on. Maybe we can try to figure it out together. But I figured that I would talk about it early so that everybody kind of knows where I'm coming from. Yeah, we'll get to it. Kevin manages to translate the demon tablet, and that tablet explains how to close the gates of hell. Yay, we're getting there. Knowing how many seasons we have left, I'm not very hopeful, but we're getting there, maybe. So there are three trials in order to make that happen, and apparently the person who does it will not be having a good time, to put it lightly. We see a weird what happens when Sam completes the first trial um, ceremony, and I'm very intrigued to know what that will continue to be. Speaking of the first trial, that first trial is to kill a hellhound. I feel like the episode doesn't touch on it nearly enough, but like for me, it was constantly in the back of my mind was the relationship between Dean and Hellhound specifically. Again, I think that the characterization was a little uneven here, but anyway, we'll move on. We find out that Hellhounds can be seen through glass anointed with holy oil. So we get the brothers in glasses this week. So like, thank you, Dab, for that one. Both of them, glasses, yes. 
even though they're not in the episode, we still have like Garth and Crowley who are very present in the narrative of the episode, uh, which I think is interesting for a dab episode. I assume there's more to it, but I will wait to understand more, I guess. Before she dies, Ellie is hoping for one last meal, good tunes, and some sex, which is exactly how Dean basically spent season three. Ellie seems like the, like, perfect Dean girl. Dean girls mean something very different in the Supernatural fandom, too. <laughs> Just letting you know. <laughs> we get two lines that really killed me this week. The first one is, I'm gonna die with a gun in my hand. And the second one is, I believe in you, Dean, so please believe in me, too. The first one hit me in a very fun way because it's a lyric from a song I love. But the other one was very, like, ooh. Like Sam coming into his own, Sam stepping it up a little bit. And in the end, Sam is the one who kills the Hellhound, so he's the one who's going to be going through the trials. Kind of saw this coming with how gung-ho Dean was. I'm like, oh, I know exactly where we're going with this. Take my hand and lead me there. This week, our theme is eagerness, and I was honestly really taken aback when I found out about the etymology of this word. Now, eagerness means like enthusiasm to do or to have something, right? It means keenness. And the word eager comes from Old French, and like it's still used actually in today's French, aigre, which means sour. Honestly, I don't think I would have ever guessed that, right? Um, so we're having a conversation today about eagerness. And I think I would urge us to kind of remember the following words that are etymologically or like that are related to the etymology of this word. So strenuous, ardent, fierce, angry, sour, acid, harsh, bitter, rough, lively, active, and forceful. Because we do see a lot of that, of all of that, actually, in this episode. Oh, we really do. Like, I feel like eagerness is very clear as it is. But, like, our little list of, like, sister words, like, really do hit home hard. The sister words. I do love that. <laughs> By the way, I do feel like I need to mention this. But I just took my asthma inhaler. And so my voice is, like, particularly deep today. <laughs> Okay, I'm not, like, out of my mind. I kind of thought something was there. It's what, what the inhaler does to me, like, uh, immediately after I take it. So it might get better, it might not, but this is just what we're dealing with today. <laughs> so if we start this episode with Kevin, uh, I think that he definitely displays an eagerness to translate the demon tablet so that he can go home and live, like, I mean, I was gonna say normal life, but, like, just a life, really, like... Because he says, I hate it here. I can't leave because every demon on the planet wants to peel my face off. I can't talk to anyone except you guys or Garth when he swings by or my mom. And when she calls, all she does is cry. I just, I need this to be over. Like he just really wants that to be over so badly that like we see him going to bed at like 2 or 3 a.m., then waking up at 5 a.m., eating only hot dogs, drinking only coffee taking a bunch of aspirins all the time. Like he's basically really neglecting his himself and his health to focus solely on the tablet translation. And I think that the words, the sister words, strenuous, ardent, fierce, angry, sour, harsh, etc. Like they're all very present in Kevin's eagerness this episode. Yeah, I feel like this lifestyle acts as like a really odd, like, counterpart or mirror to the life we saw him living before he became a prophet you know then it was an eagerness to succeed in academia and now it's the fate of humanity a little bit of an upgrade it also seems to show us just how much more he feels the stakes have been raised as well like he understands it like his lifestyle has taken a much greater hit not just rigid schedules but like actively harmful choices in an attempt to reach his goals as quickly as possible and again, to reflect on our sister words, uh, I definitely see like the rough and forcefulness as Kevin deteriorates in an alarming pace. I mean, the reality is that like you can take the guy out of academia, but you really can't take academia out of the guy. Like, you know, he was he was eager to succeed and he will succeed no matter what. Right. And uh, I think that we're seeing that in Kevin this week. 
if we move on to Dean, I think that we see Dean showing eagerness for two very different things in this episode. And this is part of the reason why I'm kind of unsure. And this is why, like, when I was talking about uneven characterization, like, this is really what I mean, because these two things are so opposite. It feels a little bit like a like whiplash to 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 see those two happening so quickly within the episode. Or maybe it's meant to be written this way. I'm not sure. And the first thing that we're seeing him display eagerness for is like the nesting in the bunker, right? He uses the word nesting, so I'm using that too. And I just think that like it's so sweet and he's being so vulnerable. And I just really, really love it. Like he basically set up his bedroom with his vinyls and his guns and like his pictures of his family. Like it's all very Dean. There's a picture of his mom in there. Like, and it's, it's, it's pristine, right? Like it's nice. It's clean. So much so actually that he gets mad when Sam throws a gum wrapper on the floor, which like same, honestly, like I'd also be mad if somebody tossed their gum wrapper on the floor of my bedroom. I love nesting Dean. Like, while well, last week Dean seemed like kind of dismissive and separated from the bunker, unlike Sam, who had a natural bond with it and like the research centric purposes. Dean's like growing comfortable and is showing us that like eagerness that he secretly has been harboring that we discovered back in Bugs in regards to his wanting a space to call his own that is comfortable. He's been here for maybe, like, I feel like timeline-wise, this is, like, two weeks, maybe? And, like, he's gone from, like, doubter to full-on making a nest. I wouldn't really say that he was dismissive of the bunker, like, but he was definitely attracted to, like, a different aspect of it than Sam. Like you said, Sam was, like, connecting to the knowledge aspect, but Dean was connecting to the comfort of it. As he mentions in the previous episode, like, this home has good showers, and we know he loves a good shower. We also see him cooking for him and Sam, and Sam is, like, impressed with him, you know? Like, anyway, Sam makes fun of him, uh, saying he didn't even know that Dean knew what a kitchen was, which, like, I mean, I guess, Sam. But, like, Dean spent a year with Lisa, and from the little bit that we saw, it really looked like he did his share of cooking. So, again, like, we're seeing his eagerness to nest and to care for himself and for his brother. And this time, like, I think it's more... The words like lively and active that kind of come through for me. I like find it funny how I completely forgot about his time with Lisa at this point. But it would make sense that in a year he grew. And while we now know it really wasn't like the case that he wanted to be in. But he was kind of doing it to fit himself into into their lives. The sake of everyone else around him who saw this as his end game. You know, like of course he would have pushed himself and have been eager to to be a good husband and father, you know, and thus would have certainly picked up these skills. Like we've just never had a chance for him to show these off. Yeah, exactly. Like they haven't, they literally haven't had a kitchen in forever. And so like, this is the time that Sam gets to see it, but it's certainly not like something that's coming out of the blue kind of thing is the point that I'm trying to make. So yeah, definitely. Uh, the second place where we see Dean being eager... My voice is back. Yes, isn't that crazy? I love it. I love it. Uh, the, sec- the second place, sorry, where we see Dean uh, being eager is just like how excited he is to do the trials to close the gates of hell. So like when he first sees the state of Kevin, it's really interesting because he talks to Kevin the way that like we've both kind of wished we could talk to Dean. Like you might want a salad and a shower kind of thing, you know, like... And then the second he finds out that Kevin has translated enough to know about the trials, but not enough to know what they all are, he basically gets him a bottle of pills for the headaches and a bottle of pills for Pep. Like, he is so eager for Kevin to get this done that all of his good advice about salad and showers just kind of take a backseat entirely, and he's giving him, like, anti-inflammatories and some kind of uppers. It's the line, like, we are, we are on the one yard line. It's time to play through the pain. And it feels like he's just decided that that's what everybody's going to have to do. Yep. Here is good old eager to save the world and risk his life. Dean, like there's a weird tear here. And I think you put it really well at the beginning, like this, like characterization mix, mix up viewed here in his actions. 
on one hand, he's being the Dean we expect, pushing for an answer and rushing headlong into danger for a chance to save the world. And despite, as you mentioned, the uppers for poor Kevin, he does seem genuinely concerned for him. Like, he pushes him, but wants it to be over so Kevin can finally rest. So it becomes kind of, like, very clear to us that Dean thinks that, like, whoever is going to be doing the trials is just not going to survive. And he is, like, so eager to do it. He's telling Sam, I'm a grunt, Sam. You're not. You've always been the brains of this operation. And I think this brings back like what we were talking about last week when Sam was kind of stepping into being a man of letters and Dean was not right. Like he, he, we talked that he was choosing more to be a hunter than a man of letters, but Dean is really taking that to the extreme. Remember how last week I said, it's not all black and white and they have like a little bit of both in them. Like Dean is like, you know, this, this is black and white thinking for him. Um, he's telling Sam, like, and you told me yourself that you see a way out. You see a light at the end of this ugly ass tunnel. I don't. And like, I just feel that this is such a sharp contrast with what we saw earlier in the episode with him, like decorating his bedroom and just like cooking and enjoying his life a little bit. And I do think now, yeah, right. So to be clear, I do think that these two specific wolves live in Dean, right? Like, I do think that there's a part of him that's, like, very cynical about the way that his life is going to end. And there's another wolf that's like, oh, maybe maybe I deserve comfort. Like, maybe I can settle in a little bit. Um, But I just feel like the way that this all comes out in this episode just feels very jarring. So I don't think this is, like, a narrative issue. Like, I don't think that... Dean is badly characterized, but I do think that there's a writing issue in that it comes off a little disjointed. Like, it almost feels like this episode went through, like, too many revisions, right, or something, or maybe it just was too short, or just, like, it should have happened over, like, a couple of episodes. I don't know. I don't know. I see both these wolves in Dean, like, again, a very apt metaphor, but it just seems like we're not giving those two metaphorical wolves the room they need to stretch their legs. They're like in a really small cage, right? They, have, they need more enrichment in this enclosure and a bigger enclosure. They need their own nests. Wolves have nests, right? Dens, I know. <laughs> but yeah, like the two wolves make so much sense because like one is eager to live comfortably and feel safe while the other is bungee jumping into a freaking volcano for a chance to maybe help someone. Like it's this divide between what Dean wants, his nesting, but what he perceives as an obligation to save everyone. And as we've seen as far back as season one, he will risk his life to do this. He's almost like eager to just get it over with. Like the quicker he does it, the sooner he learns whether he gets a happily ever after or a grave. I also want to talk about another, like arguably less narratively important place where Dean is showing eagerness. And that's with Ellie. So when they meet, he's like leaning hard on flirting with her. And the second, the second that she's also showing how eager she is to sleep with him, he literally deflates in front of us. Like we see his face like fall to the ground. Dean is always so interested in women in theory, right? Like on paper, he loves women. But the second that it becomes a real possibility, he's like, I don't know anymore. I don't know. I don't poor dean he's like so eager to like rock his masculine lifestyle but like the second someone calls him out and like goes okay yeah let's do this he's just like oh you you called my bluff i know i can't now and you know what like i didn't think about it till right now but like compare this to how he responded to aaron last week yes (laughs) they both were flustered but one was much more like, um, okay, uh, moving on. I have to go back to work. Um, blush. And the other one was like, oh, uh, I, um, excuses? I can't? Reasons? Bye! Listen, listen. I'm sure that we have examples of that happening in, in our lives, that we can see people doing that, and we know, we know what they are. I don't have all that much to say about Sam this week because like one big narrative role of Sam in this episode is to kind of like witness what's happening with Dean. 
So when they're in the bunker, Sam is like the audience stand-in almost, right? Like, because we see Dean's room through his eyes. Like, we're impressed and we're touched because Sam is those things as well. We've discussed in the past, and it's been brought up a few times, how Sam often gets less narrative driver story unless the episode, like, focuses on him more in this one case. And otherwise, he kind of becomes the audience surrogate a little bit. And that's very much the vibe I'm getting from this episode is he's back to being like a neutral force for us as an audience. Now I do want to come back to the cooking thing because Sam loves the burger that Dean cooks for him. And we know that Sam doesn't usually eat meat, but he's willing to eat this burger because Dean made it. And it's so good that even after Kevin calls and they have to leave, he comes back to like bring the burger with him to the car, which I thought was just such a cute touch. I loved that. I also now want to imagine like the con- the conflict in Dean of being like proud of his burger that Sam's bringing it along, but like you're gonna eat and baby. Yeah, there you go. It is the best shared brotherly moment in a while, and I always love these. It's so adorable and just gives us like the best dose of humanity that we've had in a while. I also just kind of love, like, to bring it back to our theme a little bit of Sam's eagerness to go back for that burger. Kind of cute. Yeah, definitely. So one spot where we really do see Sam showing eagerness is when he's arguing with Dean and he's like, listen, I want to kill a hellhound and not die. And I think in a way Sam feels a little bit like me, where he's like, my dude, were you not just saying how much you like having a room and how you're like, now all of a sudden you're ready to die by hellhound like what is going on here and i just really love that sam makes the point that he's the one who should go through the trials basically because he actually wants to live like and that's actually something that's really going to be quite important for later on like he's eager to survive this right sam seems eager here also to prove himself to both dean and to himself like that he can do this and not out of some like petty rivalry but like his own genuine like and need to be strong for himself and secondly for those around him it's a great moment and i do hope we see it develop kind of this like i always like when sam talks back to dean and kind of like no i can do this moments and i i do hope to see more of them and have it further their relationship in a positive way i do want to add because i did forget to put that in the notes but like one very obvious moment where Sam shows how eager he is, is when he actually kills the hellhound. And I don't know why, but this entire episode, I was almost about to say werewolf every single time I was going to say hellhound. And I know that they're both canine, but they're not the same. He sees that Dean, like, just can't do it, right? He's cornered by the hellhound. And so, like, he doesn't even hesitate for a second. He's like, yeah, of course, I'm going to do it. Again, like, this is part of, like, Sam's understated courage, I think, that I really, really love about him. Despite the fact that at the top of the segment, I kind of said how Sam kind of takes a very, like, weirdly neutral backseaty role, his, like, gung-ho attitude towards the end of actually saving Dean, killing the the hellhound. I almost said a werewolf that time. (laughs) Ah-ha! You've cursed me! Ah It genuinely felt like there was, like, this sudden, like, jolt of like energy in Sam at the end of the episode to like get in there save the day and then go like I can do this shit I loved it I honestly had a really hard time selecting something to talk about for critical time because I feel like I talked about like my main critical point for this episode in story time which was like that I feel that the characterization of Dean seems a little uneven throughout the episode. Maybe the script has gone through too many revisions or like maybe the episode was just a little too short a time frame for him to go from like nesting for the first time in his life to being 110% in on sacrificing himself to close the gates of hell. I think that this shift would have really totally been possible. I just found that the execution was pretty jarring. Recently, bear with me, this is going to make sense. Recently, we got an email from a listener saying that they really liked our Crossroads segment, which, if you remember, was when we made a deal at the Crossroads for the episode where we were sacrificing one thing in order to gain another. And I figured that it would be a fun thing to bring back for this episode. You know, Crossroads and all. I love that. So if I was Andrew Dabb, 
and I was writing this script, what would I sacrifice in order to gain something else? I think as much as I love seeing Dean like flustered when a woman flirts back to him, I would totally sacrifice that aspect of the episode. And instead, I would add a few more lines of discussion with Sam where Sam would be like, I see you getting comfortable in the bunker. Like, why would you throw all that away? And Dean, with tears in his eyes and the picture of his dead mom on his mind, would say that he would do anything to close the gates of hell because nothing is more important than that. And I think that with just that, like, we would have had a much better understanding of, like, Dean's motivations in this episode, right? Because it's hinted at. We see the picture of Mary. I find that it's just not, I don't know. Like, there would have been a way to, like, make a thread through that that doesn't live in the subtext. So I think we would have had a much better understanding of Dean. They set up the serve and just didn't quite hit it in those little points. That's why I'm saying I think that this went through too many revisions because, like, I'm sure that, like, at some point it must have been discussed. And anyway, there you go. I'm making up stories in my mind. If if we don't, who will? If I may then jump into Critical Time and do the same little Crossroads deal to play the game here. I honestly will be very, very frank. As soon as you said it, I started thinking of something along these lines. So I thought halfway through I had to shift my thoughts. So very on the spot with this one. But I think I would give up some of the mystery of the episode because like at the end of the day it really doesn't add much this like this rich family and trying to figure out which one of them it's after like it almost seems like so unnecessary to the plot but that's the thing with a, with a sacrifice you have to sacrifice something you like so if you didn't like the mystery you can't sacrifice the mystery right i like the mystery because i like a mystery in a show it i legitimately had a good chunk of time while watching this where i was trying to figure out who the person was and even when I kind of like thought it was Ellie for a bit I then kind of convinced myself it wasn't to be clear it wasn't Ellie who made the the, she made a deal but she didn't make the deal for the money there was a mystery that I did enjoy what I don't like is didn't really add anything so I'm willing to give up a fun mystery for to go back to really early in our episode today having somehow while not giving up the whole Sam being the one to make the kill and do the the trial, letting Dean face his fear more properly and actually have a resolution to his, his fear of hellhounds. Like whether it be like, you know, just I can imagine a scenario where Sam still has to be the one to kill it or is underneath it while it's being killed, but having Dean be the one to like get up and like grab onto it and like tell Sam, like, just go for it. Like I can hold on to this thing. Like I'm not afraid of it anymore. Oh, This week, we have a message from Nell. Before we listen to it, we want to remind you to send us a three-minute voicemail to respond to anything we discuss today or ask us a question. You can use the recording app on your phone and email us the recording at carryingwayward at gmail.com. Hi, Carrying Wayward. It's Nell. Um, So I just finished listening to your episode, um, The Girl Next Door, 703, and I had some thoughts about Dean and his behavior in this. And it relates a little bit to the previous voicemail I sent in about internalizing and externalizing behaviors. Um, So in this, we see, uh, in this episode, we see a lot of Dean's displaced anger towards, generally waves hands at the world, but especially towards Amy um, and what she does and and the fact that she has started killing people. Um, And... I started thinking that, you know, he goes on sort of this rant at her about how you can't change who you are um, and that you're, you know, you are who you are and that that doesn't change. And and I think there's, you know, Sam had explained to him about her and this stuff. And I think what's actually happening here is that Dean is displacing not his own anger, but his own fear that he is going to become his own father who was his childhood monster um so if you are someone who externalizes a lot of times fear will be externalized as anger and we know dean likes to externalize his his feelings he exhibits a lot of those behaviors so i really think that that's part of what's going on here is that dean sees what's happening with him after the loss of Cass. um 
and not to make some some big Cass Mary parallels here, but you know Mary burned up on a fire in a fire on the ceiling. Cass uh, exploded in a lake. Um, so I feel like there's sort of an interesting parallel there with elements and and death and that sort of thing. And what does Neen do? He starts drinking a lot. He gets angry at everyone. What did John do after Mary died? He starts drinking a lot. He's angry at everyone. He's throwing himself into, into work, but he's also too depressed to function. So I think you're really seeing Dean here, who is just terrified that he is turning into John Winchester, which is actually a really big development for him because in the early seasons, he sort of seemed like, I think he thought that's what the ideal was. Like he, he emulated his father a lot and part of that's his parentification and his enmeshment with his father. But we're starting to see some separation here where Dean doesn't want to be like John. He doesn't want to turn into that monster. So when he's yelling at Amy and telling her, you know, that you can't change what you are and you're going to, you know, eventually turn into the, the thing that shaped you into your, into your parent, I think he's really uh, expressing his own concerns about himself. And then I think he does a big thing by not actually killing this kid. Because if you always turn into what you are, then why wouldn't he kill the kid right now? I think he's making that conscious choice in that moment to, to not be John. So that's my thought. I'd love to hear yours on it. Um, sorry if this was like a devastating hot take, as they often are. But, uh, you know, it happened and I had to share it with the world. So... Great to talk to you as always, and see you, talk to you later. Bye. Nell, thank you so much for sharing your devastatingly hot takes with the world. Uh, I mean, we definitely appreciate them every time. Not planned, but I do find it interesting that we're talking about Mary Winchester in this particular episode, in this voicemail, because yeah, a lot of things do come back to Mary, and especially right now when Dean is not in contact with Cass, right? Because Cass is not responding to him. They've been like, you know, from our reading, they've been broken up for a little bit. And to see Dean like so eager to sacrifice himself to close the gates of hell so that nobody will suffer the way that he did feels very on brand for a traumatized child. And I hate all of it. So thanks for that. (laughs) I do love what you say when you talk about like Dean being afraid of turning into John because that's something that we're going to see a lot more and a lot more explicitly later on. So I am I am excited to get into that a little bit more. And by the way, I'm so sorry, Drew, but I have to say thank you so much to Honeybee for all of her little meows in this voicemail. They were lovely. Yes, there were so many cute meows. I always love that. Honeybee's such a good name for our cat. Nell, thank you for this voicemail. It really brought up something I didn't... Like, it's one of those like great... like I'm, I love reflecting on old episodes with more knowledge. Because we really did touch on it this week, again, the two wolves inside of Dean. And we kind of see that in this episode with his choice of killing Amy, but letting her child go. There is the part of him that goes, no, you're just going to become a monster because that's what monsters do. You become what you were raised by. and You become this awful thing you don't want to be, even if you don't want to be it. So I have to kill you, which is how he feels about John. But then he looks at this child and goes, you haven't fucked up yet you still have a chance to be good. I'm going to let you go and hope that just like me, you can learn to not be like your shitty parent. In one moment, Dean can so quickly go between both of these. Oh, it is just, it's it's heartbreaking because truly Dean's growth since even just then to force him to sit and reflect on it would be a nightmare to watch because I think he would really see it too. Oh, it pains me. My poor Dean, my poor Dean. You're not like your father. You're better than him. I mean, everyone's better than John, but that's not not, not a hot buyer. I mean, it's not even a question of better. It's just a question that, like, again, it's it's about, like, what you choose to claim as your inheritance, right? And I think lately Dean has been making a lot of conscious choices not to claim certain things from John for himself. And I, I, I love that for him, truly. So Drew, why don't you walk us through your reflection and call to action this week? 
I have a very simple little one. It's the nesting. I really love seeing Dean that way this week. It really hit me close to home. Uh, so for a very simple reflection call to action for me, it's the I'm in the process of turning my office at my job into a place I like to be and not just, again, I love my job. I love being there, but I want to make it a place that represents me, that I feel comfortable being in, that I want to be around. And I, you know, I'm decorating it. I'm putting up things that display who I am, what I'm proud to be, who I am and what I do and let my true self shine through. And already seeing the acceptance is great, but it's allowing me to connect people more. So it's a combination of being like Dean and finding a place that makes me happy and turning a, a space that is mine into a place I feel safe and happy in, but also one that is open and inviting. And your reflections and call to action this week? I find that sometimes our recordings and our themes kind of align up with stuff that's going on in my own life. Over the last year, I invested like a huge, huge amount of time and effort eagerly applying for research funding. And the main advice that I got from everybody was apply for everything that you're eligible for and something's gonna come through. Well, nothing has come through. So it's been a really tough month, honestly, uh, just kind of like really questioning myself, my abilities, but also the purpose, right, of doing this. Like if nobody wants to fund this project, then like, is it even worth doing? Like, am I wasting my time? Um, yeah, so a lot of spiraling. <laughs> and so I went from eager to sour pretty quickly. And so talking about eagerness today makes me feel called to reconnect with my eagerness to work on my project, but also maybe like readjust a few things, you know. This was Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast produced by Rochelle Castellano, hosted by Marie Vigoureux and myself, Drew Schulman. Thank you to everyone supporting us on Coffee or Patreon, especially our Bunker supporters, L, Jeremiah Thomas, and Simone. We'd also like to thank Jake Lionheart for our music and Jacqueline Tucci for additional sound editing. Head over to carryingwayward.com to become a patron or a Coffee subscriber, and for our merch store and socials. And write us a review on Apple Podcasts. Carry on our wayward friends.